Good morning. Welcome to today's event. My name is Frank Fletcher, Director of Lectures and Seminars at Daniel Morgan Graduate School of National Security. Today's topic and the title of today's event is The Geopolitics of Energy, the Nexus of Russia, Saudi Arabia, and the Global Oil Market. The energy geopolitics of Russia and the Mideast have changed considerably since the lavish years of the mid to late 2000s to the more recent leaner years of lower global oil prices. Our panel will examine some of the recent consequences of the new reality. In a moment, um, our moderator, um, Colonel Preston McLaughlin, will make a substantive introduction of the event. However, um, Our first speaker, Paul Michael Wiebe, has asked me to share with you um, some aspects of his credentials, since he will be talking about Saudi Arabia and other topics. He is a senior partner with Can-Am Strategic Advisory. He was born in the US, and he is a dual American-Canadian citizen. He is the former vice president of the Federal Liberal Party of Canada under Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau. Mr. Wiebe has led two parliamentary delegations to Lebanon. He worked as a commercial attaché in the Embassy of Canada in Beirut, Lebanon. He is on the board of two Abu Dhabi-based consultancies. He is the chairman of the Water Energy Investment Conference that took place in Dubai in 2014. And he was a VIP guest at the Abu Dhabi Petroleum Exposition in 2014. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of Port Harcourt in Nigeria. And he is the author of The Rise of the New Oil Order. So uh, we'd also like to welcome the our benefactor, Diana Davis Spencer, who is the president of the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation. And without their support, and her support in particular, this school would not exist. So I'm going to turn it over to Colonel McLaughlin now, and uh, welcome. Thank you, Frank. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm Preston McLaughlin. I'm an associate professor here in the National Security Program. Today's uh, topic is about the changing uh, energy markets that are out there today and how they're related to national security and international security matters. Uh, one of the introductory courses we teach here at Daniel Morgan, which is required for all students, is Introduction to National Security. And in it, we have a lesson that's focused on uh, energy and its relationship to national security, energy independence, and a lot of the issues we're going to talk about today and here. So this is a follow-up event for an event we had back in September. So in September, this was the uh, event we held and the topics, plus with a uh, expert panel looking at different areas around the world with energy uh, issues in relationship to national security and international security. So part of the summation of that event was that things are changing dramatically. Problems are much more complex than they were even four years ago. And we used a couple of case studies and current hotspots in the world to highlight that. So today, this is our topic, and I'm going to go down the table here, but, but first is my colleague, uh, Dr. Yuval Weber, who's a Keenan Fellow teaching here at Daniel Morgan. I'm glad to have you here today. Mr. Paul Michael Whippy, which you've heard his bio from Frank, he joined us again after our uh, previous uh, uh, event, and then uh, at the uh, into the table here is Brigadier General Tom Cosentino, whom we also welcome back. Uh, Brigadier General Cosentino is with Business Executives and National Security. 
and is a former commandant of the National War College. Sir, welcome. So today, kind of the rules of order, uh, Frank has mentioned to you that uh, there are no cards. If you have questions, you can take those up and uh, pose them to the panel at the end. Uh, today our speakers will be uh, Mr. Whitby first, Dr. Weber, and then Brigadier General Cosentino. Good morning, and thank you all for attending this uh, extraordinary event, extraordinary because it's uh, presented to you and sponsored in effect by Daniel Morgan, the Graduate School of National Security. And this school in particular uh, is groundbreaking, I think, in many ways, not the least of which is the presentation of these type of seminars and lectures. Uh, that you are now participating in. Uh, we wanted to try and provide you with some insights into real-time geopolitical developments that have an impact on key regions of the world and on U.S. national security planning and policy. So this issue of the nexus of the global oil market, Saudi Arabia and Russia, has profound implications. Now, we only have 10 minutes each, approximately. So I'm going to go right into the issue, provide some insights, which I hope you will find of value. Now, this is a quote from the Saudi Gazette, published shortly after the historic and unprecedented summit between Saudi Arabia, 1,500 person delegation led by King Salman and Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, meeting in Moscow with President Putin and his key aides. The purpose of my presentation is to pro provide some insight as to why this summit, this meeting, happened in the manner it did. So I'd like you to please just take a moment, if you can read that quote. And I think it well reflects the strategic impetus behind the Saudi visit to Moscow. That last line, I think, is quite revealing. Saudi-Russian relations are just warming up. More to expect, more to come. Good news is overdue. We deserve a break. Saudi Arabia, as you know, has been America's longest standing ally and partner in the, Mar in the Arab and Muslim world since World War II. And we have to ask the question as to why this statement reflects current royal family thinking at the highest levels. In order to try and understand that, I've prepared a timeline of some, some of the key events that have taken place that led to this summit meeting in Moscow at the beginning of October. And if you don't mind, we'll go through it very quickly. In 2013, Prince Bandar, former U.S., uh, former Saudi ambassador to the United States, and at that time in 2013, the director of Saudi intelligence, traveled to Russia for a very contentious and confrontational meeting with President Putin over the issue of Syria and the Bashar Assad regime, and also to lobby the Russians to work with open. The meeting was not successful. In 2014, U.S. and Europe imposed sanctions on Russia as a consequence of the fighting in the Ukraine. Uh, 
And let me just mention, in 2013, at the time of the Bandar Putin meeting, prices were very high, 90 to 100 dollars on barrel. In 2014, when the sanctions took place, prices began to shift. In fact, we had a collapse of prices from 100 dollars down to 30 dollars or 28 dollars in the barrel. And the reason why we had that collapse of oil prices was of a premeditated, deliberate, and calculated plan by OPEC, led by the Saudis, to crush U.S. shale production. Frank was kind enough to mention that I was a VIP guest at the Adepec Abu Dhabi Exposition in 2014. As a consequence of having that status, I was invited to a private seminar led by the OPEC uh, leadership, Abu Dhabi and Saudi, where they unveiled their plans to maintain low oil prices for the next two years, 2014 to 2016. That stress test, if you will, on U.S. shale production failed. So please keep that in mind as we discuss the raison d'etre of the Saudi-Russian rapprochement. In 2015, Saudi King Abdullah died. The Russian military deployed to Syria. And Russia said categorically that they would not work with or join with OPEC to raise oil prices. And again, oil prices were relevant, quite low, 30 to $40 a barrel, inflicting tremendous pain on many countries, Venezuela, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, other oil producers. In December 2016, we come to the turning point, in my opinion, where you see the nexus of what I believe is a highly developed, highly sophisticated Russian strategy using energy, diplomacy, and military means to achieve strategic dominance in the Middle Eastern region, stretching from Turkey to Iran to Iraq to Kurdistan and to Syria. And that point of inflection was the Syrian victory in Aleppo and regaining Aleppo from the Syrian rebels. Once that took place, and you could it, the analogy I would use in terms of World War II would be Stalingrad. Once Stalingrad fell, the Soviets had a strategic initiative from that point on. Similarly here, once Aleppo fell back to Syrian control, the strategic in initiative was with Russian-backed forces in Syria. It spelled the end of Syrian rebel movement. It spelled the end of ISIS. The die was cast. It's at that point where negotiations began between Russia and Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia representing OPEC towards Russia rejoining OPEC efforts to secure production cuts and raise the price of crude oil. That was in December 2016 when Aleppo was liberated by Syrian forces. The next month, the OPEC meeting in January had Russia as a full and willing participant with Saudi Arabia and other OPEC members in a bid to raise oil prices, which all of those production and producing countries badly needed, the Russians included. In January 2017, OPEC met. OPEC, with Russian participation, agreed to cut production by 1.8 million barrels. The Russian share of that production cut was 300,000 barrels. 
we continue with the timeline to current. The price of oil at the time of those production cuts was $58 a barrel of Brent, about four or five dollars lower on WTI. Current prices are the same, meaning those production cuts have not been able to reduce. That's true, the reduction of, of supply have not been able to increase the price of barrel. And we go back to our first con conference, uh, Colonel McLaughlin, where U.S. shale production has been a decisive factor in maintaining relatively low oil prices and preventing OPEC from being able to raise those prices significantly. King Salman, Crown Prince uh, Mohammed, and President Putin and his key uh, officials and advisors secured a wide-ranging uh, number of agreements, including investments, shared investments, uh, military sales of the S-400 anti-air missile system, and so on. Uh, I think it's fair to classify that the net-net, from a geopolitical point of view of that meeting in Moscow, was the establishment, the foundation, of a strategic partnership between America's key ally in the Arab and Muslim world and Russia. And I think you can draw a number of conclusions and draw a number of implications for American foreign policy just from that event. As testified to in the quotation I presented to you from the Saudi Gazette. And interestingly enough, just a few days ago, Crown Prince Mohammed, who is generally recognized as a driving force in the new leadership regime in Riyadh, issued what can be interpreted as a stand-down order to Sunni radical extremists, where on October 25th he said, we will destroy them and Saudi Arabia will embark on a course of moderate Islam. I believe all these issues are tied together. And I believe all these issues have significant implications again for U.S. foreign policy. Finally, I just want to uh, conclude. This Saudi-Russian rapprochement had some key drivers. One is a more realistic uh, more pragmatic vision by the new leadership in, in Riyadh, as I have mentioned, which seeks a more diversified and more balanced foreign policy and a different approach to the global oil market by inviting Russia and some other smaller non-OPEC producers into the cartel. On November 30th, at the next OPEC meeting, uh, we will see if indeed the Russians accept the formal invitation to join OPEC. And that would be a tectonic shift for the global oil market in many ways. Secondly, the Saudi visit as a key American ally, and I underline America, is a recognition, a formal recognition, of the Russian sphere of influence in the region, with different gradations depending on the national jurisdiction, Turkey or Iran or Syria or Iraq or Kurdistan. And then finally, the Saudi initiative uh, is a recognition of the urgency, the necessity of having Russia as a partner on several fronts, including the possibility of Moscow intervening with some of the revolutionary radical strategic initiatives of the Iranian regime. Modifying the behavior, nullifying the behavior, and maybe from the Saudi perspective, flipping the Russians away from Tehran to Riyadh in a new nexus, geopolitical nexus, 
that would include Moscow, Riyadh, and Washington. I'll conclude with that, and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul Michael. Um, so, what Mr. Weeby was discussing was in terms of Middle East politics of today, uh, Saudi Russian rapprochement. Uh, and so, what I will do is basically try to tell the other side of the story uh, about Russia itself. Um, and what then Brigadier General Constantino will discuss is sort of the politics of the region writ large. So, Yes. So one of the great things about President Putin is that he is all things to all people. Whatever you want out of him, he will provide that image for you. And what we have in the United States is the image of President Putin, you know, Vladimir Putin, as basically this strong, decisive leader. We, we you know, when we think about Russia in the Middle East, we see Putin everywhere. But what I'd like to actually complicate for you is that President Putin reflects the people who keep him in power. We observe a tough, decisive leader. What we don't observe is all the churn that happens underneath the water itself. And so this graph, which I'll explain, and apologies to the people live streaming it or viewing this at home, uh, I'll step away from the microphone for a second. But what we have right here is a discussion, uh, the, the graph of oil prices and Russia's reserve fund. Um, although personal uh, banking analogies don't often work with countries, what you can think of as the reserve fund is effectively something like Russia's checking account. There's a different pension fund, which should be the savings account, which you shouldn't, uh, shouldn't get into. But think of this, uh, this particular red line as the checking account. And so what we've seen is at the time of and this is a billion US dollar, 150, 120, 90, and so forth. And what we have on the other side, on the other y-axis, is the price of oil per barrel, 150, 120, so forth. So what we have is at the time of 2008, before the financial crisis, so forth, uh, oil, uh, if you remember the, the halcyon days for oil exporters, when it was up to $145 a barrel, and people were correcting about how much it is to fill their cars, in those years of the mid-2000s, that was a time in which the money coming into Russia was so immense that everyone, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, Oprah giving a car to everyone, you know, pensioners got their pensions paid, people got brand new streets, pr brand new parks, uh, the military got its money, everybody got something. And it reached this point where in the checking account, in the do-whatever-you-want account, it was over $120 billion for a number of years. But as oil prices crashed in 2008, what we start to see is the amount of money that Russia basically had at its disposal in terms of money fungible for any purpose, that's what went down. Oil prices started to cover, started to put some money back, were able to save. But what we have in the last few years is the decline of the checking account. And according to the Russian Ministry uh, of the Treasury, that checking account will be done if not by the end of this year, certainly by mid-2018. Depending on oil prices, this and the other, but let's say between the end of 2017, 2018, the checking account is dry. So that's essentially where Russia is right now. President Putin has a hold on power. He's been there for about 18 years. In March 2018, everyone will, somewhere between dutifully and enthusiastically, mm -hmm. go to the polls to give him another mandate and he'll be there for another six years. There's less money available, so that means the amount of money that goes to regular people, that has declined. But the people who aren't feeling the pinch are the people who keep him in power. The security services, the military, the bureaucrats, and the very wealthy businessmen. So as public dissatisfaction grows, we can't ignore the fact that these elite members, these people who really make up Putin's base, you know, to use American language, those people are very satisfied by this essentially series of events 
because no matter what happens to the rest of the country, they've got theirs. So part of this is to show that even when we think of you know, Russia being fairly aggressive, this and the other, as the price of uh, oil has gone down, as the checking account has gone down, we don't see Russia shrinking away from international politics. We see them continue to play a very active role. And so one thing that we can say is that the revenues and the reserves don't drive foreign policy, but what they actually do is they help determine the menu of options that are available to Russia at any given point. So Russian foreign policy in this general sense is it needs success internationally in order to justify the continued rule at home. This is a Russia in which there's just less money available for regular folks. So if there's less money available for regular folks, where else are you gonna find success? You find success in places like Crimea. You find success in terms of protecting uh, the good Russian ethnic citizen, Russian ethnic people of Eastern Ukraine from you know, the baddies in Kiev. You find it by being relevant in other regions. So in essence, for Russia itself, success is defined internationally as expanding power projection abroad to make great power status a real thing. You don't get great power status through some sort of certificate. You have to do it through doing stuff. And projecting power into a region that is not their own and being indispensable to international and regional politics, that is, for Russians themselves, that's what defines great power status. And so, let's see if I can do this right. Being president in regional politics elsewhere. As, as Mr. Weeby discussed, we have here President Putin, and these are all pictures that I just took from wire photos. These are all from the past 18 months. So this is you know, fairly recent pictures. With the Crown Prince uh, Mohammed bin Salman on the left, with Salman on the right, being present with the Saudis, chatting with them, as Mr. Weeby discussed, uh, being open to cooperation as broadly defined as possible. Enthusiasm abounds. But it also means chatting with their sworn enemies, signing agreements, helping them uh, achieve the nuclear deal, with, you know, whatever happens with that, happens with that. But Russia was instrumental in articulating and defending Iranian interests when the nuclear deal was happening, and doing the same thing right now. This is uh, Rouhani on the left, the day-to-day -day leader, uh, and the supreme leader, Khatami, on the right. Enthusiasm abounds. Meeting with uh, Bashar al-Assad of Syria, and meeting with uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel. Meeting with all sides of every single conflict, whether it is Saudi Arabia, Iran, whether it is meeting with, uh, at one point, you know, the enemy of Syria, but uh, the enemy of the United States, but the sworn enemy of Israel, and meeting the sworn enemy of Syria, just being present in every single diplomatic cleavage, every single diplomatic problem, means that Russia is present in terms of shaping the outcome of all of these different controversies. And then we get here, probably less well-known figures, but the fellow on the left sitting down, this is the Minister of Natural Resor Resources for the Kurdistan Regional Government, Ashi Khawabrami. And the fellow on the right is the CEO of Rosneft, the Russian state oil company, Igor Sechin. And again, signing agreements, being enthusiastic. The agreement that they're signing right now is that Rosneft agrees to buy the main pipeline, or half the interest in the controlling pipeline of Kurdistan. So that whatever happens with Kurdistan, they, they declare a referendum, they lose their autonomy to Iraq, they essentially have dealings with Turkey, dealings with Iran, what have you. See, Russia at this point, through Rosneft, through essentially the oil diplomacy that Mr. Weeby was discussing, they not only have an opportunity to gain energy resources abroad in Kurdistan, diversifying away from Russia itself, but they're now part of the solution to whatever happens with Kurdistan. They have injected themselves to be, if not the main, great power protector of Kurdistan, but at least co-equal with the United States. The United States uh, offers, obviously, funding, military training, uh, as well as military hardware, but this is the actual cash that Kurdistan could use today.
to solve whatever problem that they have, to solve whatever needs that they have, Russia provides that money. So we see that in all of these different aspects, this is the way that Russia both identifies great power status, you are present in a region that is not your own, you are indispensable to the resolution of international and regional politics, by essentially being friendly to every single person. So that in the medium term, if let's say Russia wants to become part of some sort of Washington Riyadh axis, that's available. If they want to essentially make Moscow, Tehran, make that the they make that the axis, that's also available. Whatever happens with Kurdistan, also possible. And this is basically what we see in terms of Russian great power diplomacy. Try to get goods right now, try to get benefits right now, but maintain flexibility for the medium term so that whatever else happens, whatever decision the United States have, uh, makes, that they're able to take the other side of that bet. And so I'll, I'll conclude right there, but like Mr. Whitley, I am looking very forward to the next OPEC meeting. There's been a lot of enthusiasm about whether OPEC will make an invitation and whether Russia would uh, accept. Um, perhaps Mr. Reby thinks that this might be that Russia may. I am far more skeptical uh, because I mainly believe that Russia wants to maintain uh, not just sovereignty in a general sense, but flexibility in the medium term. And having to make Russian energy decisions through other people uh, might violate that. So with that, I turn it over to General Constantino, who will sort of discuss these broader issues. Thank you. Thanks. Those were um, uh, great presentations uh, for both of my colleagues. Um, I'm going to come at this just a little bit differently, uh, give you what I think is a, uh, a decision point that the United States is coming to in, in the region. It isn't quite at that decision point yet, but it's very close to it. Um, I, I, uh, I'll do this by, I'm going to give you my bottom line up front, what I think is going to be the result in some time within 2018. Um, I, I'll talk about some factors that I think influence the region, and then uh, talk a little bit about the paths that, uh, in the military, we call them courses of action that the, that the uh, U.S. might take, uh, but options. Um, and, and I think there's really three kind of options based on events, and I think the U.S., as it always does, will not take any of them. It will try to do a fourth one uh, <laughs> because it won't like the, the options the way they, they come out. Um, so the first thing, uh, where do I think we'll be this time uh, next year? Uh, I personally believe that we will be in a low-level, uh, covert uh, fight with the Iranians. And uh, the Iranians have actually been in that fight with the United States on and off for uh, well over a decade, since at least uh, 2003. Uh, but I think uh, we'll be in the fight. We'll be fighting back. So what does that mean? I think it'll be uh, uh, through surrogates. Uh, through special operations forces, through intelligence agencies, uh, I think that there's going to be uh, there's going to be killing going on on both sides, and that fight could very easily, for a combination of reasons, uh, either miscalculation uh, or uh, overly aggressive behavior by uncontrolled elements of the Iranian uh, uh, security forces could turn into a conventional fight. Um, now, how, how do we get there, and why do I believe that? Um, so the fir first thing I would say is there's some factors happening right now. Uh, the biggest factor that uh, is weighing on, on all of this is U.S. shale oil. It's, it's changed the game, and it's really kind of broken our, um, it's broken our, our strategic calculus that we've had for decades, which was um, originally uh, oil, going back to Jimmy Carter, oil and uh, Israel, uh, you know, guarantee the supply of oil, uh, guarantee the security of Israel, and, uh, and then later, uh, since the, at least the 1990s, uh, countering terrorism. Shale oil is kind of 
uh, broken that, that model. And uh, the U.S. is very elastic uh, in its ability to, to fill in gaps and not sensitive at all to disruptions in the oil market. Matter of fact, in some ways, uh, dudes in, in dropping oil wells in Pennsylvania will make out if uh, oil is disrupted in the Middle East. So that's a, that has really upset the, 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 uh, um, the way we think about it. The second thing is, um, is a perception. It's a perception that I, I think is held both by our friends and our opponents, that the uh, conscious policy of the United States, at least since 2007, has been to appease um, uh, Shia expansionism in the region. Uh, the, the, uh, the efforts, uh, the decision not to uh, remove um, uh, Prime Minister Maliki in Iraq in 2007 when, when uh, uh, extremely bad behavior was happening. The uh, decision through the uh, Obama administration of not countering attacks on U.S. forces by uh, Iranian surrogates and Iranian uh, uh, special forces and Quds Force. Um, and then the continuing focus by the U.S. government on maintaining the territorial integrity of the state of Iraq has convinced both our allies and our, uh, our opponents that we have a unwritten uh, policy of, that has crossed administrations of appeasing Shia expansionism in the region and, uh, and Shia succession uh, policy because we haven't done anything about it. I believe that that both sides believe that. Do I believe that that's our policy? No. But I think some of the effects of what we've done have pushed us in that direction. And then the last thing uh, I would say is the, um, was the, the complete collapse of any kind of moderate opposition in Syria. And, and the fact that, the, that pretty much anybody who was fighting the regime was, a, a, was an Islamist. Now you can argue how much they believed in that. You know, if you're a 17 year old young man and your your mother and father have been killed, your sister's been raped, and and the only people fighting uh, the regime and the Russians and the Iranians are Islamists, then that kind of you know they're you know the they're your your ally. So whatever the case is, the opposition to this movement has not been us. It's been the Islamists. And, um, and that, that's a factor that I think runs through um, uh, below the noise level and, and in the thinking of uh, the, the Sunni uh, regimes of the region. So, where does that leave us? I think uh, the fall of Kirkuk has brought this uh, decision point forward. We've got the, you know, the first option that the U.S. has is a, uh, a retrenchment out of Kurdistan. We've got this operation in Kurdistan and in uh, western Iraq and in eastern Syria and one option is to say okay we, we brought down the Islamic State um, and uh, we're, we're going to back out of this mess that is Iraq and Syria and, and work from a, a peripheral strategy from, the, from outside possibly with our, uh, our counterterrorism operations uh, moving back to uh, to the Gulf states and down to, to Jordan. That, that's one option. I think the dangers of that option um, uh, are that the vacuums always get filled. And, and in this case, um, the vacuum would, would be filled by a return of, of uh, uh, Islamists uh, who would, in fact, be sponsored by our Sunni allies because that would be the only option to oppose this uh, Russian, Iran, Iraq, possibly Turkey, Entente that, that would be rolling back the moderate regimes. Uh, so that, that I think is probably the least likely course of action for the United States, but it is an option. And, and oh, by the way, we're gonna be heavily committed very soon in Africa because as we've dropped the Islamic State, the bad guys just move 
to, to more verbal appeals. Um, the second, and I think it's the one that the U.S. Uh, most wants to happen, and it's going to be the hardest to pull off, which is what, uh, what our, uh, uh, my colleagues talked about, and that would be an entente uh, with Russia. Try to break Russia away from the Iranian regime, uh, bring Iraq back to its Arab identity, uh, assume that we can, we can bring Qatar back into the fold, and, and renew what would be perceived as a, a moderate alliance to contain Iran. Uh, the problem with that is, number one, politically, right now, anybody working with Russians in the United States is, uh, is liable to end up in, in front of the uh, special prosecutor. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a, there's a, a uh, even though there may be a strategic logic in this, there's a, a political reality that this would be very hard to, to bring this policy forward. Uh, the second thing is the Russians just like causing trouble for the United States. That's their, that's uh, if uh, they often do not operate logically or strategically, they do, there's a certain emotion attached to their approach and in their mind, it's all zero sum. But the weaker we are, the more engaged in trouble we are, the better off they are. So actually convincing them to, to break from Iran would be very hard. And, and then the third thing uh, is that you've got this uh, stew of, of Kurds, uh, minorities, Sunni, uh, and all operating, the Turks, uh, all operating in no man's land of Western uh, Iraq and Eastern Syria. So very, very hard to pull this off. Third option, which is to recognize all this is happening, to recognize we're not gonna break the Russians and the Iranians from each other, and, and for the US to step up its commitment to both to Iraq, to assure them that we're not gonna bail on them, to our Sunni uh, allies and to Israel that we're not gonna leave this mess for them to deal with, and to ramp up uh, our efforts to bring, uh, to cajole Qatar back into the fold and to convince the allies to let them in. All of that together uh, would be uh, uh, to deal with this uh, Russian-Iranian alliance and to make sure that Iraq does not end up in it. So that, that would be a heavy commitment of resources to do that. So we're not going to do that at least not initially. So what will we do? I think we're going to wish that we could do number two, and for political and, and, and operational reasons, we won't be able to do it. We're going to come to a realization that option number three, that we have to counter Russia and Iran, and we have to, uh, to be more aggressive in, in our leadership, is going to be what we accept, but we're not going to want to put the resources in to do it. So we're going to try to do number three with m m diminished resources, which I believe will lead us into a um, into to fighting uh, in the next year. Um, we've already seen the reintroduction of uh, uh, EFPs uh, from Iran to its surrogates. Um, Five, six days ago, Qasem Soleimani, head of the Quds Force, was 15 kilometers northeast of Kirkuk and indirect fire on Kurds. Um, the, the, Iran is already operating as a military power inside Iraq right now, and, and, as well as, as inside Syria. Um, so this recognition that we can't back out of this and, and, uh, and let things happen will force us to try to lead, but the, the desire not to become entrenched and put sufficient resources in will mean we'll try to do it on the cheap, and that's a recipe for, for, uh, for a fight. And uh, I'll stop there, and, uh, and then maybe we can uh, talk about it in Q&A. Just if anyone else has questions, I'm collecting note cards, and we'll I'll be glad to give them to the moderator. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have about seven questions here, all pretty good, some student questions as well. So I'd like to pose them to the panel and may ask for an additional 
member of the panel to comment on the same question. First question is I would like to ask Dr. Weber. How effective are the U.S. sanctions in Russia? And how effective would, I'm trying to read this last word. sanctions. Um, they, President Putin has often said that the sanctions don't bother us, but what we've seen over the past few years is a concerted attempt at all levels to get these sanctions removed. Um, there's a way of thinking about the sanctions in terms of how much they harm the Russian economy. Uh, what harms the Russian economy in a far greater sense has been the drop in the price of oil. For reasons that you can uh, feel free to take my class and we can go into, Russia has not diversified its economy for the last several hundred years. So every time they talk about big economic reforms, that, that's a very evergreen sort of thing to go on. The sanctions are, uh, they're effective at the margin. Uh, and they're effective at the margin because they prevent at, at sort of like the really big uh, levels, they prevent Russian banks from borrowing money abroad and they prevent Russian energy companies from engaging in partnerships with uh, foreign oil companies to do technology transfers. So the price of oil falls independent of whatever happens in Russia. Had sanctions not existed, had Crimea Ukraine not existed, we would be talking right now about the bonanza of investment into Russia. So there's a counterfactual world um, that we're not sort of experiencing, uh, and that's probably where the, the, the sanctions really hurt. Um, so that's, so I'd say the, effective, the sanctions are effective, but by preventing, essentially, uh, the Russian political economy from being <coughs> renewed for another five, 10 years. Yeah. <clears throat> Brigadier General Cosentino, uh, I'd like to ask, how effective would an African commitment by the US be in regards to national security issues and energy? So, you know, again, <clears throat> energy is not the driving factor for us. Matter of fact, that, you know, one point that I probably should have brought in as a factor is um, uh, in the developed world, primarily uh, U.S., Europe, and Japan, uh, the millennial generation has already accepted uh, in their mind that the move should be towards alternative energy sources. Non, uh, so that's going to happen regardless. So we've got this tremendous amount of of uh, petrochemical resources, uh, natural gas, and oh, by the way, increasingly more effective science towards wind power, solar, battery storage. Um, so energy is not going to draw us into, to, uh, uh, into Africa. Um, what's going to draw us into Africa are millions of people getting up and walking to get away from uh, collapsing societies and uh, uh, bad economic situations and or terrorism. And um, so that, that's the first thing. So our focus will be on, I believe, will be on terrorism primarily, and the European focus uh, will be on trying to bring good governance and, and stem the uh, economic challenges of Africa. So I, whether it's successful or not, it, again, it depends on how committed we are and what are, how far our resources could uh, uh, could stretch. Um, I think you'll see us uh, increasingly uh, try to strengthen our relationship with both Egypt and Morocco. There's only a couple places that you can operate from to, to counter uh, these challenges that are there. Paul, oh, you, you had a comment for the... Yeah. Uh, uh, just a quick <coughs> comment on the uh, question of sanctions, which I think is really very interesting, and it's a question that should be raised more often. Um, I tend to think sanctions have become a default for U.S. foreign policy calculation. Uh, 
in the case of Russia, I think geostrategically, the imposition of sanctions against Russia, notwithstanding the events of Ukraine, may have been one of the best things ever to happen to the Russians. Why? Because it forced the Russians to come to terms with the Asian markets, the most lucrative markets in the world, particularly with China. Where in 2011, the Russians were not exporting a barrel of oil to China. Now, Russia is the largest exporter of crude to the Chinese market, displacing the Saudis, establishing a strategic partnership with the second largest economy in the world. Not an alliance yet, but a strategic partnership. And we've seen the Chinese recently take minority positions, equity positions, in uh, Rosneft, in uh, Yamal LNG, and a petrochemical firm called Sibir. There are military and, and industrial partnerships emerging. And I think that really is to the long-term benefit of the Russian economic condition, as Dr. Rucker has spoken to. It also, in my opinion, led to the Russian thrust southwards into the Middle East. I would even go as far to say, if it were not for the sanctions, we would probably not have seen the Russian military deployment in Syria. Okay, that's a great segue to the next question, which is from Mr. Webby. How do Russia and OPEC, Saudi Arabia, plan to hedge against China's shift to a greener economy? And is there a shelf life of OPEC is a geopolitically influential entity. To the latter point, the shelf life has come to an end. As General Constantino has mentioned, and based on our first uh, geopolitics of energy conference in September 26th here, um, the global oil market has dramatically changed as a consequence of U.S. production from shale deposits, where effectively the United States is now the swing producer, subject to certain market conditions. And that was a title that Saudis held for decades ago. The Saudis, as I've mentioned to you, have been reaching out to the Russians over the last couple of years because OPEC is no longer, as a cartel, able to calibrate the price of oil. Russia, as the largest producer in the world, can certainly assist. In other words, I think what the Saudis are looking for is for the Russians to be the swing in the swing <coughs> producer status. Now, the question is, what will, the, what will the Russians do come November 30th? Will they accept to become a full member, co-president, in effect, of OPEC? Or will they hold the status quo? and maintain the options that Dr. Weber has outlined in terms of traditional uh, Russian strategic calculation. Uh, I think they'd be wise to maintain the position they have right now. Because the game in the oil market isn't pricing for countries that have a diversified economy like Russia or the United States or Canada. The game is not pricing, the game is market share long-term market share. And that's what we're doing with LNG exports out of the Gulf Coast. Uh, that's what we're doing with crude shipments uh, to other parts of the world. Garnering market share. And the prime jurisdiction, market jurisdiction, to secure your long-term market share is in <coughs> Asia, China, Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, Indonesia, even. So I think Russians will be wise to maintain their options, maintain their flexibility. And the other point that was raised in the beginning of that question, uh, General McLaughlin, could you reiterate the first point of that question? Yeah, oh, China, uh, green, China, green. China's green yeah. economy, yeah. We'll have to wait and see. <clears throat> uh, I think it's fair to say 
The majority of countries who signed on to the Paris Climate Accord, including China, uh, did so half-heartedly in the hopes of receiving benefits uh, accruing from United States funding into the Paris Accord, the instrumentality of the Paris, Paris Climate Accord. The Chinese are moving forward with you know, massive uh, construction of coal-fired power plants using, you know, to the extent they can use clean technology. Yes, they're going to put heavy emphasis on solar and wind, but those will remain niche uh, uh, markets in China. Uh, there are a number of issues uh, pertaining to power generation that simply cannot be replicated with solar and wind. Uh, the uh, Chinese importation of crude oil continues to rise. We're up to 9 million barrels importation of crude. LNG is a huge factor, as it is in Japan. So, uh, yes, we'll see an increase for sure in the market share of green energy and technologies, but this is going to take a long time, and I would say to you that we would be well into the next century before we see crude oil shipments in China reduced to an insignificant level of effect. The next question is for Dr. Weber. Recently, as the U.S. has become more isolationist and the sentiment more ethnocentric, don't you think that Russia is simply attempting to take on the leadership role or position that the U.S. formerly held? It's, a, it's an excellent question because this really goes to what Russia's been doing for about the last quarter century and essentially what are the options available to them right now. Um, for the Russians, they view the world as essentially fundamentally unfair right now. The international order is unfair. At the end of 1989, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, George H.W. Bush, they brought the Cold War to an end. And the Soviet Union would have been accorded a leading role in international security, a leading role in European security, and they would have been fine with that. Lose the external empire. Uh, I see some of our Polish friends in the audience. Poland goes its own way, but Soviet. The Soviet Union is still, if not a, a hyperpower, but some sort of permanent number two. That would have been fine. The Soviet Union itself comes apart in 1991, and Russia essentially gets the short end of, of that stick. And Russia has been trying to work for the past quarter century to make the world look like 1989 instead of 1991. That's the big picture. So for them, this is not trying to take for the first time some amount of global leadership. It's trying to get back what they think is their natural position, given their size, importance, and reach. So in essence, for what the United States is doing right now, they look at essentially the excesses of US leadership, the inability of the United States to constrain itself, Iraq war, financial crisis, um, essentially the election of Trump itself, viewing these as aspects of US failing to constrain itself, Therefore, United States is dangerous. Therefore, I should go in. And wherever the United States is not, because Russia doesn't have essentially this left-right ideology, the entire elite and the president is essentially allied behind the idea of Russia as a great power, Russia as this big place. So that means if they want to take a part of Ukraine uh, and support anti-government rebels there, but also want to support the government of Syria against rebels there. Those are both consistent when they're allied to the idea of Russia as a great power. And so in essence, what we're seeing right now is just the plan that we've, and the foreign policy that we've seen for a long time, but just accelerated. What Trump's election has done is just show that, as I was talking a little while ago, the menu of options available to Russia is shrinking, sort of in a generic sense. But what they can also see, and you know, if you read, I don't know how many people here, but if you look at Russian newspapers day in, day out, what they view as happening in Washington right now is that Trump tried to make some sort of new deal. Trump's, Trump tried to reset relations in a way that took Russian interests at heart, and this is what he's being punished for. So the way they view US politics right now, that if the next president, whenever he or she may come, uh, whether it's tomorrow or in 2020 or some different point, if that president is a Democrat, that po Russia policy will be cartoonishly anti-Russia. If they believe it is, if it's a Republican who comes next, then that Russia policy may not be as cartoonish, 
but it'll be traditional, hawkish, anti-Russia stuff. So they view, in terms of what's happening in the U.S., the time to get anything done is before Trump is gone. The menu of options, because of the declining oil revenues, the menu is shrinking. So all these things together are pointing towards doing something now, trying to get involved in Middle East, Middle East politics right now so that it can be traded for <coughs> stuff that they really want. New security treaty with the United States, favorable resolution on Ukraine, you know, that's for the medium term to uh, essentially uh, shake out. So in terms of Russia trying to take a leadership role because of the election, the election just makes essentially the opportunity um, a bit more acute and a bit more open right now. But they've been trying to do this for a while. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna ask Brigadier General Constantino to take a stab at this next question from the audience. Question is, what evidence is available to confirm that Saudi Arabia is embarking on a moderate form of Islam? Uh, well, obviously, the, um, I mean, the, the, the show pieces, I think, you know, the women driving and stuff are, uh, are in fact, the, you know, a messaging campaign. But the, the bigger uh, point is the strategic decision by Mohammed bin Salman that uh, Saudi needs to, uh, it's threatened in two ways. It's threatened uh, internally um, because, uh, as it tries to, to do economic and political reform, which is gonna be very difficult in the country by, um, uh, by this kind of Islamist uh, uh, cancer that it let metastasize, and in some ways, uh, uh, you know, set conditions for it. And it's uh, it's threatened by a uh, revolutionary Iran Iranian regime whose goal is to bring down the Saudi royal family, and to, if not break apart Saudi Arabia, to greatly diminish its power and, and uh, as a hedge to to Iran. And the, um, so therefore, they've got to pull together uh, a strategic alliance, and I think you're seeing that emerge between uh, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait is <coughs> kind of hiding under the, the table, Bahrain, and, um, and, and an attempt to kind of browbeat the Qataris into taking their, you know, taking a, a Bahraini type of subordinate role by the Saudis or acquiescing at some point to the U.S. desire to bring Qatar back in as a full partner. Um, and the only way they pull this off is with the U.S. It can't be done as an independent uh, um, uh, entity and therefore that is why you've seen the outreach not just under under President Trump, but also under President Obama by the Saudis to uh, to reach out and um, uh, and take and be part of this quote unquote moderate alliance, and uh, because it's it, it's they're scared to death of uh, of both of those threats. So I I think that's the 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 evidence. Now there's a lot of systemic things and a lot of uh, uh, bad actors. Uh, that the Saudis and others in the region have let operate for a long time. It's, it's going to take a while to kind of clean that out. Thanks. Okay, Mr. Whitby. With Iran as Russia's seemingly favored Middle Eastern ally, how far can Russia and Saudi cooperation go? To what degree is regional dominance a zero-sum game? Well, it's gone very far already. Uh, it's evidenced by the uh, military alliance and military strategy that's taken effect since the Russian military deployment in Syria in 2015. Uh, but I would caution, uh, in referencing my two colleagues, that uh, the Russians are not obligated to the Iranians. If anything, it's the other way around. Um, the Iranians, 
can overplay their hand right now. They do have the upper hand uh, in the uh, Shiite-Sunni hot and cold war that we've seen over the last few, few, uh, few years. Their best position right now is to consolidate their gains, as we've seen now in terms of Kurdistan. If they try to extend those gains uh, in whatever particular sub-region, could be Yemen, could be on, in Syria, wherever, I think Moscow uh, would not take kindly to it. I think Moscow has this new strategic option with the Saudis that could run very deep indeed. And it could run very deep as a consequence of U.S. support for that relationship. In other words, from the perspective of the oil market, from a long-term view, it's in our interest, U.S. national security interest, to see oil prices sustain themselves at a certain range, which could be in the 40, low 40s to low 60s range, which would ensure, relatively speaking, the stability of several regimes, meaning Venezuela, Nigeria, Libya, and even Saudi Arabia. It would not be in our interest to see prices go down to a market level, a sustainable market level, in my opinion, in the mid-20s. So how can the United States, which cannot interfere in the machinations of the free market, how can the United States influence a sustainable price range that would allow weak regimes to sustain themselves? At least they collapse and we have massive humanitarian conflicts, humanitarian crises, and civil conflicts, which would erupt around the globe in various jurisdictions. One way to do it is an indirect diplomatic effort to sustain the Russian Saudi condominium on oil pricing. Keep it in this range that I mentioned, somewhere in the you know, mid 40s to the low 60s. Thereby keep a lid on the explosive issues facing Libya, and Venezuela, and Nigeria, and others. Maybe allow to buy some time to find solutions to governance and the crisis of civil societies in these countries. So, yes, I think that relationship, for a number of reasons, strategic and related to the market uh, can run very deeply. The Saudis are the vulnerable party in this relationship. Uh, they know time is not on their side. They know that U.S. production will continue to increase because we have a glut of supply, an infinite supply <coughs> of oil and natural gas. And that prices is left to the own devices, to the devices of the free market even in the global market, even with OPEC's intervention. The real price of crude should be in the 30s. That's the real price of crude. Take away manipulation, and speculation, and countries offline, and geopolitical crises. Neither the Saudis nor at least a dozen other countries could survive with prices in that range. Can, can I just throw on something? I, I think that uh, Russians are riding the Iranian tiger and they don't know how to get off. Um, and uh, that their power to influence this is extremely limited. Uh, it wasn't Russians fighting in the streets of Damascus or Aleppo uh, or any of the other places. The Russians came in, they provided some infrastructure, they mainly uh, helped support the Assad regime to make a, inter a Western intervention more costly. Um, but it was uh, Quds Force, um, True Believers, and Hezbollah, and uh, 
Jay Shalmati and other uh, um, uh, Iraqi Hezbollah, these these are the, the young men who have been actually in this fight. And um, the uh, it, it's entwined now. And uh, the ability of the Russians to, to, to it's not 19... 80, where they can regulate their, their, their proxies and get them to do what they want. They've, they're sitting on top of a, a, a revolutionary group that feels that this is a, uh, a totally zero-sum game, that it's either they win, the Iranians, or, or, the, uh, or the Saudis and, and, and the U.S. win. And they, they're not going to stop. And, and so the ability for Russia to stop this is, I think, almost non-existent. So the question is, what do they do? Do they try to break with Iran, which means they, they have to convince the Assad regime to break with them? Or, or do they try to, to keep foot on, on both sides of this and, and balance it? I think I would, I would much rather be in our position than the Russian position. They have a, 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 they've got demographic disaster. Um, their, uh, their whole economy is almost totally dependent on the price of oil, which, by the way, we control the price of oil. They don't. We're the swing country. And, um, and they're getting gobbled up economically. Uh, their assets are being bought off by the Chinese. So, so uh, to be quite honest with you, they're a very dangerous opponent because, uh, because they're in such a weak condition. Uh, and. Uh, I, 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 I wouldn't want to build, it would be great if Russia would recognize this and seize the opportunity that they have to be a balancer in the region and actually may, maybe gain some of that prestige that it wants through, through good action. But if you think that they're going to somehow control uh, Iran, uh, I think it's a punch. Sir, sort of just a quick comment on that. Um, over the past, let's say, 12 to 18 months or so, there is a recognition that, at least the, the way the Russian foreign policy community was thinking about the intervention into Syria, is that this was, from the Russian perspective, decisive. But then there was the second thought that if Russia intervenes on behalf of Assad with essentially all these actors on the ground itself, that this would make Russia essentially part of the anti-Shia, the, sorry, the anti-Sunni Shia camp. And that would reduce its um, flexibility later on. So there was the debate within the Russian foreign policy community that even though the alliance with <coughs> Iran, with Assad, and sort of all the sort of uh, smaller actors is important and needs to be pursued, if that is pursued at the exclusion of all the Sunni countries, well, then that means that the Shia actors are the ones shaping Russian policy in the Middle East. And so that was then the idea that you know, we as Russia need to also be nice to Saudi Arabia so that we could essentially help balance every sort of uh, relationship. I think this will be the, we have time for one more question. Yeah. Do the break at 12.15. Okay, uh, we've had a couple of questions that are duplicates or have been answered previously, so I'm just gonna pull them out while I hang on to them. Last question is kind of, uh, I'd like for each panel member just to make a brief comment on but from today's uh, conversation, the question is, for Russia, how large is an issue is NATO, the NATO alliance? So I would like to start with uh, Dr. Weber and go to Mr. Whitby and uh, Brigadier General Constantine. So NATO for Russia is both the best and worst thing to ever happen. <laughs> it is the best thing because it creates a sense of threat and a sense of purpose. Um, so long as NATO exists, the, you know, the walls feel like they're closing in. So whatever happens domestically can be justified. Would you rather sell the country to NATO? Would you rather sell the country to the United States? No, of course not. I want to defend Russia with all my might. Therefore, Russia is necessary. Um, but also in terms of what is the negativity of uh, all these countries joining NATO is that it demonstrates in some sort of very dis sort of distinct fashion what are the limits of Russian power in Europe? The, the sort of the evidence that all these countries are trying to get as far away from Russia as their institutions can allow. 
So it, show, it basically shows them up politically. It also helps justify the way that Russian governance happens domestically. Mr. Whitby. Uh, during the Cold War, uh, and I defer to you, but during the Cold War, I think one of the great worries was how the Soviet Union could outflank NATO in the, uh, in the uh, southeastern uh, quadrant, meaning Turkey. Uh, they never did, obviously. But what's very interesting, of course, now is to see the Entente between between Ankara and Moscow, uh, <coughs> the visit of President Erdogan to, uh, to Moscow in, uh, in I think it was August uh, 2016, a month after the attempted coup in Turkey, and uh, I think this is a very interesting uh, development. It fits within the scope of our conversation today, where we see uh, uh, military sales being conducted uh, between, uh, from Russia to Turkey, where we see uh, uh, common diplomacy being initiated by the two <coughs> several fronts, and uh, where there's a lot of talk as to whether or not Turkey uh, will leave NATO at some point in the near future and join the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and, and, and uh, shift the entire uh, architecture of NATO to, uh, to something that uh, it greatly fears. Um, and I think this is something to, to be, to, to be uh, studied as we move forward. Uh, I think President Erdogan has a very strong uh, uh, control over security apparatus in Turkey. I think he's been deeply offended by the coup that he blames on the United States. And I think uh, this certainly fits into the strategic planning that the Russians have been uh, working on these last uh, few years. Sir. Well, um, you know, so NATO at the end of the day <coughs> doesn't exist without the United States. So it really comes back to you know, the United States is the key actor. Um, I think there is both an opportunity and a, uh, uh, a real challenge for the Russians in NATO, and that amongst the European partners, the dynamism and the energy inside NATO, uh, it comes from Eastern Europe and not from, uh, and not from uh, traditional partners of the old NATO. Uh, and comes from Poland, frankly, as, as a leader there. Um, so at some point, you know, there, this is again like the Entente in the Middle East. It, it, there's an opportunity for the Russians because there's a, a common concern about um, migration and, and the threats of, uh, of uh, 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 radicalism coming out of the Middle East that's shared, it's common shared concern. Concern, uh, by both the Eastern European NATO members and, and the Russians. And um, so that, that leadership could lead to uh, uh, an opp opportunity for dialogue. However, Russian occupation of Eastern Europe is still fresh. And um, uh, I think the, the paper tiger that the Russians really are, the dangerous paper tiger that they are, is, is going to be um, exposed by increasingly strong actions by an alliance of the Poles, Hungarians, the Romanians, the Bulgarians. They're the energy of, of NATO. And, uh, and, and I think that they're receiving a very receptive audience in the United States. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem, it's a challenge for Russia. Because uh, Poles aren't going to go running around in Africa to stop migration or to deal with terrorism. They're going to be preparing themselves for hybrid warfare with Russia. And, and so there, there's an uh, uh, opportunity, but, but also a big challenge there. Okay. Uh, 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming today. We uh, greatly appreciate your participation in the great questions uh, today. Uh, we hope to see you again here soon in the future. But please, a uh, round of applause for our panelists.